Welcome to NCSS Here For You. Since 1958, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to high-quality services which promote healthy living and emotional well-being to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle Counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. We take our role in the community seriously and strive to provide the highest quality services. According to Eric Erickson, a noted developmental psychologist, every person must pass through a series of eight interrelated stages over the entire life cycle. NCSS provides a continuum of services to meet the needs of individuals who at any point seek assistance. NCSS's purpose is creating a stronger community one person at a time. Now, let's get to today's show. I'm Joe Halco, Director of Community Relations for Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, and welcome to another episode of NCSS Here For You. Each month on this program, we discuss a human services topic, and we do that with staff from one of our three service divisions. Our three service divisions are Behavioral Health Services, Children, Youth, and Family Services, and Developmental Services. And on occasion, we have guests from organizations that NCSS collaborates with throughout the year. This month's episode is titled, The Impact of Adverse Childhood Experiences. Healthcare reform is sometimes viewed as a responsibility of policymakers and medical professionals. However, in order to effectively impact and improve the health of our community, healthcare reform must be a collective initiative and practice embedded within the field of healthcare, human services, and education. Childhood experiences, both positive and negative, have a tremendous impact on future violence, victimization, lifelong health and opportunity, making these experiences a public health issue. To discuss the importance of early childhood and adverse childhood experiences in greater detail, I'm pleased to introduce this month's guests, and they are Danielle Lindley Mitchell, Director of Children, Youth, and Family Services, Samantha Thomas, Children's Initial Response Team Leader, and Amy Johnson, Parent Child Center Program Manager. I'd like to welcome all of you to the show this month. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So let's start with what are ACEs? So ACEs is an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And basically what those are are traumatic events that happen before an individual turns 18. Mm -hmm. we learned this language from a study that happened back in the late 90s, uh, but we're really just catching up to this incredible research that was done. So they um, surveyed at the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, there were two doctors, Dr. Anda and Dr. Felitti, and they connected together and they looked at what are those early experiences uh, that their patients have been seeing. So they were both doing some work kind of separately and they were finding that when they were looking at say obesity, um, they were seeing that a lot of their folks that were um, struggling with obesity were endorsing some uh, traumatic events in their past. And so what they stumbled on was this concept that these adverse childhood experiences actually impact uh, an individual further in their lifespan, so past the age of 18. Um, in their original study, they looked at um, 17,000 white middle-class adults. Since then, a number of other folks have um, asked these questions of more diverse populations so that the, the data is a little bit more robust now. Mm -hmm. And basically what they've come down to is 10 different adverse childhood experiences. So uh, there is uh, three different kinds of, ab of abuse, so physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Then there's two different types of neglect, emotional neglect and physical neglect. Neglect. And I think physical neglect, sometimes it's hard to understand what that might mean. And so that might mean, um, you know, what were you um, as a child not provided with enough food? Mm -hmm. um, did you not have enough to eat? That's an example of uh, physical of neglect. Physical neglect. Sure. And then the other ones are, was a family member of yours um, using drugs and abusing drugs? Um, did you witness that? Did you witness domestic violence? So someone harming your mother. Um, and they are specific about that um, in this research. Also, parental incarceration. Was anybody in your family um, incarcerated? And did anybody in your family struggle with um, a mental illness? So that's a pretty extensive list, mm -hmm. to, to say the least. 
So why do these matter and what is the impacts? Right. So what are the impacts? Yeah, it's pretty vast and pretty incredible. And I think that what's amazing about this research, and it's incredible that we're catching up to it now, is that they didn't just find that based on what happens for folks when they're younger, um, that they have maybe some mental health outcomes. I think folks wouldn't necessarily be too surprised about that. Um, if somebody has a lot of traumatic events in their childhood, they might not be surprised that someone's going to experience depression or maybe have some suicidal thoughts, things like that. But what's so remarkable about this research is that what they found was that there are physical health impacts from individuals experiencing multiple ACEs. And what they found was that as the number of ACEs increase, so um, if an individual experienced one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 ACEs, there the level of risk for some poor health outcomes increases. Um, what's important to note about that specifically is that uh, this information is really not on an individual level. So if folks were to go out after seeing this show um, and really want to find out what's my ACE score, mm -hmm. what does that mean for me? It's important to recognize that it's not predictive. This research is about populations, not about an individual. So it's important if someone were to go out, um, you can find it online, findyourace.score.com. You can certainly do that. Um, and if someone were to do that, just to remember that that doesn't mean that they are doomed to sure. negative sure. Um, health outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit um, mm -hmm. as well about some of those um, ways that we can prevent ACEs. But there's a lot of resilience factors that individuals um, can hold and can carry and can develop in a lot of the supports and services that we provide at NCSS can support folks to build those resiliencies. Um, and so what's really shocking is that the level of physical health um, is pretty significant. So an individual who experiences multiple adverse childhood experiences um, runs a higher risk for um, heart disease, um, uh, obesity, diabetes, other autoimmune diseases like arthritis. And what this research did for our field in the mental health field, but also in the medical field, was it gave us some language to talk to each other. And it also gave us an opportunity to research why why is that happening? Mm -hmm. And so what we've learned is that when people, when they're little, um, when they're under 18, when they experience a lot of chronic toxic stress, the important piece about that is that we want to recognize that there's a, a little bit of stress can be really motivating and mm -hmm. really healthy, right? So if it's brief, if it's predictable, mm -hmm. um, if it's <clears throat> moderate, it can motivate us to do really great things in our lives. You know, if we don't have a little bit of stress, um, before the test on Friday, we're probably not going to study and might not do so well. So that little bit of stress motivates us and allows us to do really well. But when people experience prolonged, um, chronic, unpredictable amounts of stress, um, that's when we start talking about toxic stress. And typical stress reactions kick off all of these um, hormones that are released in our bodies, cortisol, adrenaline, um, and those are really adaptive. It helps us to survive. It's you know, downloaded from us in our caveman times. You know, it helps us to survive. But when we have somebody who's experiencing toxic stress and those chemicals are coursing through their bodies constantly, it shapes and changes their physiology. Um, and that's where some of those um, health outcomes can occur. It's also really important to recognize that our brains are malleable. So, our brains are impacted actually by the types of experiences that we have when we're young. And so when someone's experiencing a lot of adverse um, childhood experiences, um, they actually use different parts of their brains. So um, I'm not a neuroscientist by any uh, degree, but what I've learned is that, you know, our brains develop from the back forward. And so the back part of our brain is really about um, survival. Uh, it regulates functions in our body that aren't maybe typically what we're conscious of. And as your brain starts to move forward, you start developing emotional centers of your brain. And then right at the front is um, in the frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, um, is where we can solve problems, um, manage impulsivity, think really creatively and abstractly. And what we've learned, what our field has learned by all these incredible folks out there doing all this research is that when folks are in stressful situations, their brain shifts back to more survival states. So we're using 
um, kind of less of our IQ, if you will. Um, and so when we look at kids who've experienced a lot of adverse childhood experiences, a lot of their brain development is in more of this survival place. Um, and so they don't have necessarily as much development um, in that, that frontal cortex where um, they really want to be developing skills so that they can go to math class mm -hmm. and sit and um, do math problems and all those uh, different types of things. So it's really quite incredible what these experiences in our childhood have on us for the rest of our of our lives. But again, um, it's really, really important to remember that there are a lot of factors mm -hmm. that help us to be resilient. There's a lot of um, protective factors that can balance out um, some of those negative experiences in our lives. And uh, speaking of that, how common are they? That's a great question, Joe. Um, they're actually quite common. Uh, we know that in the state of Vermont, 50% of children in our state have one or more ACEs. Um, and when we start to look at children who have two or more ACEs in Vermont, that drops to 25%, but that's still you know, a really high percent as far as we're concerned. Sure. Um, and we know that the ACEs that we're seeing most often in our state, um, children experiencing or families experiencing socioeconomic hardship, or also a high percentage separation and divorce, um, as well as children living in a home with um, an adult who's experiencing um, drug and alcohol issues. Um, so, that's, so that's what we're seeing and that's what the data is showing us. Mm -hmm. And we should look at, you know, what, what can we do to prevent them? Right. That, and that's, so. <laughs> that's important work to do, definitely. So one of the things that we really like to talk about are building those, and Sam mentioned this, building the protective factors um, in families and in children. Um, we know that these protective factors help families build strengths and create an environment that promote optimal development for children in the home, in the family. Um, one of the biggest ones that we talk about are developing social connections. We know that when families and children are isolated, a lot of bad stuff can happen. We know the risk of abuse, the risk of neglect really goes up when um, families are feeling stressors and you know they're isolated and they don't have someone to talk to to kind of bring them down. They don't have someone to connect with to offer them resources. So we know that those social connections are really important for families. Um, Building resiliency, I know Sam mentioned this as well, um, building resiliency for parents and caregivers as well as children. And we know that um, for children, when we look across the, the 10 ACEs, that friendships and relationships are the biggest, um, the biggest things that we can do to, pre to prevent ACEs is that having those strong relationships it can't be underestimated having a caring, nurturing relationship with at least one adult. So not only is that helping to prevent, but it's also helping to mitigate the risk for children that do have um, one or more ACEs. Um, we know that knowledge around parenting skills and child development is really important for families, um, as well as understanding the social emotional development of children and helping to build that social and emotional development. If we have a child who has really strong social and emotional development, we might not see as many big behaviors which can really help families to stay centered. Um, and one of the biggest ones is access to concrete supports. Um, we know that at NCSS, we offer so much to children and families to support them to do the prevention work and the early intervention work. Um, so I want to focus, I know that's our next, we're moving into, but I'd like to talk about what concrete supports mm -hmm. we offer. Can I just jump yeah. in? I think one thing to really know is that as a community and a healthcare system, um, early identification of these right. ACEs is really important and I think that as a system of care that's one thing that we're really looking at um, when you look at integrated health care we're building measures of how do we work with families and individuals to screen to even see if these factors are affecting them and I think that is huge when you look in the world of prevention and how do you identify ACEs at an earlier point in time mm -hmm. because I think <coughs> we would wait until there was a crisis or something came up 
and then we would, you know, get services into the home or connect with resources. And so as a system of care, we're really moving in a direction of how do we identify this way earlier and so that we can um, decrease Absolutely. that and support families in a very different way. Absolutely. So it's really important to look at it from that lens. That's a, a great point. And, and Amy, to where you were about to go, talking about supports that may be available to to mitigate these effects, uh, if you could expound on some of those. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Sam for the start of this one okay. for our sure. concrete supports. Yeah, so Amy was just talking about that social support and social connection. And I think that that piece moves with, you know, when you think about prevention and then you move to maybe intervention, mm -hmm. that that piece is really critical throughout that entire spectrum. So when we're looking at prevention, we're looking at building those connections, but when we're looking at intervention, we wanna build those connections. And so ultimately, when you look at the services that we provide, say at NCSS, um, there's always an opportunity for that social connection. So really everything that we're doing is an opportunity to support someone to manage the effects of adverse childhood experiences. Um, that being said, we also have a number of supports that are perhaps more targeted to um, traumatic symptoms. You know, so you know, we're working on offering some trauma-focused um, interventions. We currently offer child and family traumatic stress intervention, um, and that's an opportunity for um, a kid who's maybe just experienced a traumatic event to come in with their parent and get some support in really the immediate aftermath of an event to try to mitigate um, and minimize further development of you know some post-traumatic symptoms. Um, we also use the attachment regulation and competency model in our division in children, youth, and family and that's really a framework that allows us to look at all of the work that we do and consider how do we support kids and families to build resilience in the face of adversity, in the face of these mm -hmm. um, different events. And that's something that we thread through all of our programming um, in CYF to make sure that all of our staff are really getting that good training to provide that level of support. We're also um, offering a new model, and um, that's what's so exciting, I think, about working at NCSS is we're always looking for the next thing that's going to help our clients and community. Sure, yeah. And uh, so we're offering uh, just beginning some child-parent psychotherapy, and that's an opportunity for the little ones, the zero to six kids, mm -hmm. to get some support with their families around how do we deal with you know, events that have happened to them. And Amy, did you want to jump in and add to any of that? Because with, with the, I think when you mentioned the zero to six, that then leads us into the Parent Child Center and all the great work that's being done, um, not only in this arena, but, but in general. Right, definitely. Um, I, I think there's a lot of really exciting partnerships and collaborations going on with the Parent Child Center and our home visiting model. Um, we, have, we have staff that are going in and supporting families around numerous different challenges that they're facing and really having that person in the home who they can talk to again that that social connection you're not alone there's somebody here to help me and it's okay to ask for help I, I think that's really huge and we're really seeing um, these families showing growth and building these protective factors by having somebody come in and, and be there for them and sit with them and listen to them and and say you're not alone this mm -hmm. This is something that we all struggle with. Um, raising children is really challenging, and we're here to help you and support you. So the home visiting piece is, is really huge. Um, we also have parenting classes, parenting groups, um, and play groups are really, really great in terms of showing families what it's like to come together, build connections, how to play with our children. Some of that's some of that stuff we think is intuitive and it's not necessarily intuitive. It's nice to have that role modeled and different ways to deal with behaviors or even just to re read a book with a child. Um, and as families come to these play groups, they start to take leadership roles and are able to model for other families and other caregivers and really show, I got this, I, I'm learning, I'm growing, and, and I can be a role model and a mentor as well. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a team that works on um, supporting families around child care, and I think that child care and the impact of child care, whether a child's at a registered home or they're at a center-based program, that's really huge where even if they're coming from an environment that is turbulent, 
they're in a space for large chunks of their day where they're interacting with caring, loving adults who are teaching them these really great skills around communication, empathy, accountability, nurturing skills, and all of these things really mitigate risk. So even if we're seeing a child in a toxic situation, those resiliency skills that they're developing and these other skills that they're developing in childcare are really mitigating that risk and offsetting um, some of these other things that might be happening in their lives. So the, the childcare component is really huge for them developing those relationships and building those skills. Now, what is going on in NCSS right now relative to ACEs? So I think in the last hmm, probably two years, this has really got a lot of um, attention. And I think as an agency, we really have taken a leadership role in figuring out, and I think within the community and saying, you know, we have a piece in this and that we need to be doing our part to address trauma and ACEs. And so a couple different initiatives have started. Um, we have a trauma-informed care community or, um, committee. And this committee has really looked at, they're charged with looking at numerous things, but a couple of those are so what if a client walks into our lobby? What are the things that are gonna impact them based on their experience and their trauma? Are we doing things that could be a trigger? Are we doing things that would support and provide maybe a more welcoming um, and less stressful or toxic environment? So looking at that, we're looking at how are our clinical practices within our um, different divisions? How are we developing consistent practices? And then using that as a mechanism to support families that have experienced trauma. There's a lot of education that goes on with that group. Um, they do a lot of blurbs and articles that are internal and external. And so that's been really helpful. And so that um, as an agency, we're hearing some consistent messaging around how to support our community and families that have experienced trauma. Um, Sam's been really key in going out and providing a lot of consultation to schools and community um, members and I think this has really taken off. I know that she's done um, some phenomenal trainings, has done some ongoing consultation, almost to the point where we're at capacity and have to figure out what can we do because we know that this is such a growing need and so I think NCSS has been really instrumental and Sam has been instrumental in getting that going. Um, you know, just doing this show, we're really looking at branding and supporting our community and understanding the um, importance of ACEs and addressing it. And so we're looking at doing um, a series of a messaging around that, supporting people in understanding what is ACEs and then the different programs that we offer and the different work that we do with community partners. I think sometimes people are confused around um, all of the programs at NCSS and then all of the agencies. And so this is a nice opportunity to highlight the partnerships. Um, we're working on looking embedding, like um, we've talked about through a couple different topics of embedding practices that support this work um, and aligning that in different ways. Um, Sam had mentioned ARC, and so we're looking at that. We have the Strengthening Families Framework, which looks at protective factors. That's been really predominant in the early childhood world, so we're looking at through integrating family services, how do we um, expand that. We do have pockets throughout the, uh, throughout the agency that offer concrete supports to family. Mm -hmm. I know at a state level really advocating that when we roll out a program, how can we um, have a pocket of money in there to support concrete supports because a family is not going to work with us if they're, if they're sitting there worrying about how are they going to pay their rent that month or how are they going to have heat or electricity you can't do the good treatment that it will be would be helpful to that family until the concrete support in that crisis is addressed and so really working with our state partners and understanding that we have numerous um, opportunities for our staff to be a part of some leadership groups that are taking place I know um, Sam is very active in the child and family trauma work group that's happening at a state level um, I'm a part of what's called a flourishing communities um, steering work group and I can explain a little bit more what that is later in this show um, we have membership of, that is a part of the strengthening family statewide committee and so I think that we're really fortunate to have um, staff that are very invested in this and want to see not only at a local level, but how can we um, influence the state in the direction of how they're headed and really addressing ACEs. And then we had this movie that um, I believe it's titled Resiliency yes, um, Resiliency that we've been really hosting. And um, I think that is a way to educate community partners and families and the, our staff around um, what is ACEs and why is this important? And I think Sam might be able to speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the Resilience movie um, highlights, again, the work that I mentioned earlier of um, Dr. Felitti and Dr. Mm -hmm. Anda, um, and talks about where did we, where did it start? You know, some of the things that I was talking about earlier, but it also highlights some of the folks that are 
um, really working hard to prevent and mitigate ACEs, uh, the impact of ACEs right now. So it highlights the work of this really incredible um, pediatrician out in San Francisco, I believe it is, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Um, and she's done an incredible amount of work in her practice where she um, asks the ACEs questions to all of her patients. Mm -hmm. um, the way that she does it is she gives them a list, they have all the questions, and she says, I don't need to know which ones you experienced or, yeah. sorry, your child experienced, just need to know how many. Mm -hmm. um, and that starts the conversation for her uh, to start thinking about that. And the film is a really great opportunity to have folks learn about this and figure out, oh, I wonder I wonder what I can do about this, you know, in my life, in my sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a really great opportunity. We've had some showings in our community um, in different um, mm -hmm. arenas. We were a part of, um, Prevent Child Abuse Vermont showed it to the legislature a couple mm -hmm. months ago. And so it's a really nice opportunity to start um, getting more information out there. And, and we'll be holding some showings as well um, that we'll be, um, I'm sure you'll be putting out there on our behalf to let community members know about. Well, and, and having seen it myself, I mean, it's riveting. Mm -hmm. And it really does lead to terrific discussion afterwards. So I know that, um, you know, through your hard efforts, we're gonna be having several viewings, or more than several viewings uh, as we move forward. But I think it'll be important uh, to get as many um, families involved in, in actually seeing this and being able to talk about it uh, as possible in the future. So Absolutely. I think it's a nice way of wrapping up a lot of what ACES is all about mm -hmm. and um, you know why it is so important that um, everybody become more familiar with it. So um, on that note, it's hard to believe, but our time is up. We could talk about this for hours. Um, it's very important initiative. I think it's one that uh, there are many in the community who will be very, very happy to know that NCSS, among others, are really incorporating this into the practice. Mm -hmm. um, because I think as we're finding, it's that um, as people age, you know, it's certainly a lot of these events that took place at a much younger age which helped to shape who and what they are. And in some instances, they want to make changes but have a hard time understanding why right. perhaps they need yeah. to make changes. So. Uh, with that being said, I, uh, I do want to thank my guests, Danielle Lindley Mitchell, Samantha Thomas, and Amy Johnson for being on the show today and sharing their insights on the importance of early childhood and adverse childhood experiences. I also want to thank you, the viewer, for spending time with us again this month. You can learn more about NCSS and all of our programs and services by logging on to ncss.org. I'm Joe Halco, and I'll be back next month with another episode of NCSS, Here For You. This has been another episode of NCSS, Here For You. We hope that you found today's discussion informative and educational. Since 1958, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to high-quality services which promote healthy living and emotional well-being to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle Counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. Thanks once again for tuning in this month. NCSS's purpose remains creating a stronger community, one person at a time.